dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. Getting things done. How do I pass from ability to action? I may know what is right and may know what I need to do, but actually doing it is a whole nother thing. What's more, sometimes the risks involved of actually doing something and putting my name to paper are quite daunting. What if I'm wrong? Can I afford to pay the consequences for my choices? Many people prefer to simply hide. How can my faith in God help me? to pass from potential into action and make the difference I really want to make. Welcome back, everybody. I'm glad that you're here to go deeper with us, the St. John Leadership Network, as we try to help form leaders in Christianity and to bring Christianity into the hearts of leaders. And you know, it's funny because as a Catholic priest, a lot of times people struggle to say, why does a Catholic priest talk to business people? Or why does a Catholic priest talk to organizations? Like, wouldn't it be better for you just to stay in church and be giving the sacraments? And I would say, yes, actually it would be. (laughs) Staying in church and giving the sacraments is a fine thing. And we all need that. I mean, there's nothing higher than the sacraments of Christ and and preaching God's word. It's just that at the same time, uh, you got to be able to extend that word directly into where lives are impactful because that's where impact is made. And, And a lot of people struggle to see where their faith actually meets the reality that they face every day. And so I, I do this as an extension as a priest, and, and I, I take the knowledge that the church has had for centuries, and I make it a, a, a applicable to the problems that you face every day. And by so doing, I hopefully I make a bridge where you can, by doing these studies and by listening to what we've got going on and by learning from us, see an invitation to go deeper in your personal relationship with Christ and to grow in your faith. Because there's nothing that's more attractive to faith than when people see that faith can help them with their real daily problems. And one of the biggest things that I've noticed as as a priest, and it's the same in family life as it is in business life, is that it is easier to talk the talk than to walk the walk. We can even say this about discipleship in general, being a Christian, right? We can know what's right on the inside, but then doing what's right is really where it gets hard. And I got bad news for everybody. Like, that's what Jesus says our judgment's going to be at at the end of time. It's not going to be on what we had in our deepest hearts of hearts. It's going to be on what we did. So, like, our ability to act out on faith is the difference between having a dead faith and a living faith, as St. James says in the Bible. And, and God will reward us or punish us based upon our actions. And we can get upset about this. We can not like it one way or the other. But honestly, it's a great invitation because I see it as God taking our personal dignity so seriously as to say, I made you to be responsible. You're not the same as a plant. You're not the same as a cat or a dog. These things are not responsible for their actions. You, however, own your actions from the inside. You get to choose them in a spiritual freedom because I made you in my image and likeness. And being in my image and likeness, yes, you need to act accordingly. And an essential part of being human, therefore, in the image and likeness of God is our ability to make decisions, make choices that we own with an inner freedom filled with responsibility. And again, it can scare a lot of people today. And obviously it does because you see all kinds of attitudes and actions in our world where people are running away from this. They, they, you know, so an essential one of those is that people say, I feel like I'm good inside, even though I act on the bad side, I'm still a good person. I'm like, yes, there's a lot of that that's true. And, And you are a good person and all of us make mistakes and all of us do bad things, even on purpose sometimes. And all of us are, are, are less than what we could be. I'm not really addressing that question because at least you're trying, at least you're acting. And sometimes you act poorly, 
But what would happen if you never act at all? Like what would happen if you knew the truth and you knew things and you, and you simply refused to act period. So you make a decision. You've gone through a whole strategic planning process with your team. You've decided on the following, you know, three objectives that you're going to be hitting this year as your key objectives. And you're then you need to pass into an action and actually begin. And you just start to wimp out, right? Because now you have to hire. Now you have to take a loan out. Now you have to, you know, take a risk and stretch this person. You have to have a difficult conversation to move this person from this position to this position on the team. So you can hit the objectives. You got a question. You know, you have all these things that suddenly are difficult to do. And so you just kind of wait and sit back. And it's almost like a lot of people deal with problems in general. They treat problems like they're people. They say, if we bury them, they'll go away. Well, it's not the case. (laughs) In fact, problems are like seed. If you bury them, they will grow and multiply. We have to learn to face the challenges and face the problems. And that's where a lot of leaders fail. And you can see it across the board. I think about marriages a lot of times where you tell, a typical wife will come to me saying, I tell my husband to do things. I tell my husband to do things and he doesn't do them. He says, yes, yes, yes. But then it never gets done. And they come all exasperated, you know, and I typically, you know, putting on my priest hat, I say, well, you know, if it hasn't worked for the last 25 years to nag your husband, maybe you could try a different approach. (laughs) Maybe there's another tactic. I mean, you know, on the one hand, you're just exasperated because he's never doing it. He's never doing it. But on the other hand, well, it's like, well, obviously you do it. You getting exasperated and nagging him isn't working. At the same time, like you can see, it's not only with husbands, but it's with it's believers who don't tithe, who don't support their church. It's people, no one volunteering at different clubs, letting great movements and in, in initiatives to help young people fade away just because there's no one to do the cooking or no one to do the cleaning up afterwards. It's, it, there's like a, a spiritual sloth. And lack of energy that is, is not just in, found in the workplace and in that type of leadership, but that's found in general. And it's where we choose to stay in what is potential and what we know we could do instead of braving the cold and the windy waters of actually doing something with consequences attached to it. And the longer that we prolongate youth in our society and treat our our young people like they're, they're just young instead of people, we will continue to build an insulated environment where choice and the thrill of risk and the realism of shaping yourself and your destiny by, by freedom is not rewarded. This is not the attitude that God makes. He gives us free will from the moment we're created in the womb. And when we reach the age of reason, we have moral responsibility. That's why Catholics hear confessions for children from the age of seven on up. Because from seven on up, they're making choices to either act or to not act. And they're responsible for those choices because they have the use of reason. Well, we all do, right? So how is it that therefore I can move from a culture that says you don't have to do anything And actually, you're rewarded by not choosing into a culture that says, whether you're right or you're wrong, at least you did something. That's where Christianity shines with a wonderful proposition that I actually think is more attractive for our young people than the proposition of a secular culture that robs them of the glory of decision and exchanges it just for safety. We're going to talk more about that. Would you like to hear more from Father Nathan? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a two-minute glance at the gospel every Sunday morning right to your phone. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So we're talking about the, the glory of risk and the glory of making choices as part and parcel of what it means to be human. And I want to go back and extend this to you as a leader Because when you are trying to develop your ability to influence your company, influence your stockholders, influence your followers, influence the people that you manage, one of the key aspects is that I have to be a person of action. Thinking about things is safe. Making plans is safe. 
right? I can stay in the womb of what might be and what could be. But when I actually pass into action, I show my colors, I reveal my true self, so to speak. This is a frightening thing and because it has consequences. What if they don't like me? What if they don't follow with me? What if I fail? I mean, what, who will punish me if this plan doesn't go down? As long as I only have a plan or as long as I only have a type of vague intention inside, I don't have any consequences. No one's going to get mad at me for thinking about doing something, right? They're going to get mad at me about whether it works or it doesn't work. And that can be very scary. Our jobs can be on the line. Our, our managers can be looking for numbers and production from us. And it just seems so much easier to be the one that's sitting in the stands uh, coaching or talking about what's happening on the playing field instead of the one who's actually carrying the football. And I think it's the same in businesses as it is in our families. Because why is it that it's so hard for me to actually mow that lawn? Why is it it's so hard for me to clean the house? There's something going on inside of my, my mind that's keeping me from crossing that one inch threshold that makes all the difference from to actually engage the talents that I have towards the need that I'm trying to meet. It's a one inch threshold and it's called making an action. Well, fortunately, this is where Christianity really shines and can help. There are many reasons for this, but principally, we got to remember that at the heart of the inability to go from a plan or an intention into an action is going to be a form of fear. It might surprise you. You might say, well, no, it's just laziness. It's, I mean, I, I want you to look at it from a different perspective. I want you to look at it as what am I gaining by not acting that I'm afraid of losing if I do act? What, what do I get out of staying in a passive position with respect to this situation or this choice? And, and what do I, that, that I'm going to lose, right? So if I have a good position in the company and I try an ambitious strategic plan, I could lose my job, right? If I have a certain status quo with an employee where things are at least peaceful and I have a difficult conversation with them, I could inflame the situation, Right? If I had a uh, comfort right now on my couch and I go out to mow the lawn, right? The proverbial worst case scenario, uh, I could in fact lose a beautiful afternoon where I could not think of anything and instead busy myself doing something that I'll have to do again next week anyway. It, 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 there's an operative moment in our minds where we pass through a type of practical logic St. Thomas Aquinas calls it a practical syllogism, but you, I mean, you can, you can call it what you'd like. What he's saying is that you have a reasoning in your mind and in that reasoning is going to say, it is better for me to not act than it is for me to act. And I want to say that sometimes that could be the case in a particular scenario, but by and large in life, it is not a way to live. And if you go and as a, by and large as a rule, and you find yourself repeatedly doing this, saying it is better for me not to act than to act. You, you, you need to question that because it might be better for you given in a certain set of individual or self-centered, self-regarding circumstances to not act. But in the long term, every human being was made for action. We were made to give ourselves. We were made to love and action comes from love and action determines love and a life without love. That is a life without action, right? A life without actions filled with love is not a life that's worthy of its true calling. Christ calls us to give love and therefore he calls us to act. And that might mean risk to ourselves, but it is even, even greater risk to not act at all. To stay back in a potential land where everything is safe and there's no, nothing that can hurt you, but where you don't actually emerge out of the planning and out of the development into results. And let me tell you, if nothing else, there's nothing more frustrating for the members of your team than when the leader of the team refuses to do what is obviously, what obviously needs to be done. Right? So that sense of responsibility to the people whose happiness or success is dependent upon your own can on the one hand freeze you in fear, 
So you're like, it is better for me not even to try because at least we have this than to risk doing something, the consequences of which might mean losing this. And so you say, it's better for me not to try. But on the other hand, if you don't do anything, you also won't be able to bring about the success that's been planned for. I mean, Jesus didn't say, I want you to think about and and plan for going to the ends of the world to make disciples. (laughs) He said, go and make disciples, right? That doesn't mean you don't plan. You need a plan. And a lot of times that's one of the best ways to overcome that fear. How do I overcome a fear of risk? I take the time to really make a good plan. I think if you struggle with this in your organizational leadership, and it could be from small things like having a difficult conversation or moving someone on the team, and it could be about big things like making a a, a whole, whole new department in your organization or expanding your production, whatever that might be, if you struggle with this, realize you have an ally in your planning ability to go back and to make your plans lot tight as good as you can with the numbers and the metrics as good as you can. And then you can even make a plan B if you'd like, or you can have different angles to attack the same problem from if this fails, then this happens and thinking through the process, you can overthink it. You can overanalyze it, but having a plan to execute against could be an excellent tool to then passing from the little bird on the branch to the Eagle in flight. And the thing about an eagle in flight is that when you're flying, basically you're just falling forward. It could be a very scary thing to fly because there's nothing underneath your wings. Exactly. I know. That's why we prefer to cling on to that little branch. But if you hang on to that little branch too long, well, you're not, you're, go- you're not going to get to where you need to go. And your organization will suffer from it just like your family will suffer from it. I've got to be able to find an ally. And one key ally is making that plan. Whatever it is, let's remember that on the other end of our action, there's the one whom we love. There is the one whom we are called to serve. Be that the customer, be that the client, be that our employees, be that our shareholders, whoever it is. We're not called to live a life of safety and security for ourselves. We're called to give ourselves at the service of our fellow human being. And that is done through action. That's where Christ is calling us. Would you like to start your Thursday mornings with a scriptural leadership lesson? Join the St. John Leadership Network, where Father Nathan hosts a 30-minute call at 6.30 a.m. in all four U.S. time zones. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So looking at all the reasons we're afraid to act in this great challenge that that, that action poses for us, we find an ally in St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas was a Dominican friar from the 13th century, but he did an amazing job of compiling in his wisdom all of the thought of antiquity and the church's great teachers uh, up to that point into a kind of synthesis uh, where he outlines for us the, the key elements of a human action. And he outlines that there's two types of human action. There's an action that's producing things like you're standing at the line at a production facility and you're working that line. Well, there you don't have to really think too much about it. As soon as you go to the job, it means you're going to be doing that job. They tell you what to do. They tell you to punch in. You punch in. You have this time a slot. They give you the tools. They give you the, the objective and you do what you have to do. Right. So there's not a lot of, 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 of effort needed because the effort was to show up at work. And then there's another type of work where you are trying to attain a good that's not just production, but that's actually the good of a whole of life. And in this type of action, another step is needed where you can see we could do this. We could do this. We could do this. There's many possible ways of doing it, which is going to be the best way that takes into account not just production and profit, but the whole of our lives. And there, wow, that's the the cross of leaders to have to make those decisions where your business decisions and your ethical decisions overlap. And for there, he says, there's a special act that's needed to pass from the planning where you have many choices you could make into the actual action. And that, that passage he refers to as imperium. 
imperium, I-M-P-E-R-I-U-M. It's a Latin word, and it means command, where the mind, he says, has to command the will, do this. So the, the slogan for Nike, right, just do it, actually is a great translation of that exact word. And they may have even gotten it from there somehow in their mind because it's this command where the mind has to just tell the will, even though you're afraid, little heart, of all that could happen and all of the things that are risky, the mind says, this is the one and you must do it. And that active imperium is key for our success, not only in business, but in life. And what Aquinas goes on to show us beautifully is that that act of imperium is the mind at the service of the will. It's the mind at the service of the heart, which means the very first thing that we need to get in touch with to do this act well, to stop being people who are just passive or potential or having a good heart, right? But not necessarily doing anything with their lives is to get in touch with our love. If you show me where your love lies, I'll show you where your life lies. What do you love more than yourself? Right? And the more someone's in touch with that, the more that they brave action. I'm thinking of the, the beauty of, of a young mom, for example, right? That these women, like, it, they're all, it's all wonderful and they get married and it's all great. And then they have these kids and it's like a lioness is released upon the world. They, they, they can balance two of them at the same time while picking up something off the ground and talking to their friend on the phone. And if their days are just nonstop filled of activity, you, you can't afford to be a young mom and to just like, at the same time, relax in your life. You are a woman of action, right? When you do that. Why is that? Well, it's because of the kids. I mean, they don't even think twice about it. You go to bed thinking about the kids. You wake up thinking about the kids. You live your day for the kids. That's a beautiful example of, of what if I had the same love for Jesus and everything that I did? And this is Christianity again, where God comes in to say, I'm going to permeate your life with purpose. A Christian should be a person who lives in perpetual purpose. There's nothing that I do during my day that's not aligned with the love that I have in my heart for my God. Because God has come to this world in order to lift me through everything back to himself. He is behind every circumstance. He's behind every opportunity. He is behind every aspect of my life asking me to live it for him. This means that for a Christian, the real problem isn't whether or not we're going to make mistakes. It's whether or not we're going to try. He talks about this in the, in the parable, for example, right? He says, some guys I give 10 gifts to, and then they make me 10 more. Congratulations. That's wonderful. They'll get a reward of 10 cities. Other people I give only five to, but they make me five more. And that's great. I give them five cities. Ah, but then there's the fella that has the gifts and he buries them. And he says, the reason I buried them is because I was afraid of you. He says, that person, he take away what he had. He didn't even try. And then, you know, basically he goes on to a punishment. And it's an incredible parable that our Lord speaks about because he's saying that the real problem isn't what you risk. The real problem is that you're not going to take a risk at all. You've allowed something in your life to be bigger than your love. Again, I'm not saying to be foolish. I'm not saying you have to do everything all the time, but to own the fact that you're not doing it. That's, that's actually an action to say, this is not the way to go. We're going to turn away from this. That's not what I'm talking about. It's when I know what I need to do and I know what I should be doing and I choose to demur. Okay. That, that is not where God is going to be found. Love doesn't demur, right, from doing what it knows it needs to do. Love makes us bold and makes us courageous. And especially the love of Jesus Christ, who so loved the world that he braved the, the horrors of the passion in order to save us. This is our model and what he expects of us in exchange. He wants us to brave the horrors of the laundry that we need to fold, <laughs> which can sometimes be quite horrific, right? Or brave the horror of another family reunion with awkward conversations of people that you are fighting with, right? It's same thing. Brave the horrors of leading your company like it was God's company and doing what's right for your people, even though 
There are so many things that you could do that are different. All those things, that bravery, that courage to pass into action is a courage that flows from love. And the mind comes to the aid of the weak heart, which sees the risk and what we could lose by loving. To, 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 to say, here is a good plan. Execute against this plan. Taking the time to sit back and to make a, a, a battle plan for yourself can give your mind enough fodder to actually pass into action. And when we do that, we become people of impact. Without, in order to influence the people around you, you need to be a person who is, who is acting. And the more you can score in the terms of doing things that are good and righteous and, and, and thoughtful and considerate, right? I guess in other words, there's a temptation for a lot of us to, to spend our time pointing our fingers at the reasons why we don't do what's right instead of owning that we have the ability to make any change we want to if we just put our hand to the plow, own what we need to do and discipline ourselves enough to do it. Leadership is a question of influence. Influence is an effect of action. Action requires having desires, making plans and, and understanding things thoroughly and then passing into action by letting our mind tell our heart, do this. This is the path forward. Don't be afraid. It, it, it is much better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all, says Shakespeare. And I have to say it's this way. It's the same thing in Christianity, right? It is better for me to lead and to make a mistake than for me to never lead at all. I can adjust in mid-flight. I can watch for the measurements. But sometimes even great things can come out of plans that were miscalculated. But nothing will come out of inaction. So let's give it a try. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.